I first met Melanie in a prison cafeteria approximately two years ago. And she waved over and smiled, and she's very um, tiny and uh, kind of innocuous looking, not what you think of, right, with a, a femme fatale who has slayed her husband. And we just started talking, and she just opened the floodgates and started talking about her case. Just to give you a little background, in Melanie's case, um, they claim that she cut up her husband's body, put him in suitcases, and threw it over the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. Mm -hmm. The trial, it was on court TV, so mm -hmm. the public was able to watch as things unfolded. Mm -hmm. However, they still are not what they seem. I also want to point out, it's not necessarily about guilt or innocence, sure. it's about did she get a fair trial. Of course. I think the prosecution definitely got it wrong, whether she did it or did not do it, who knows, but the prosecution um, did not get the timeline or the story, I think, 100% correct. Agreed. We've definitely found some instances where even a different judicial decision, Amy, Amy talks about it a lot in the podcast, just mm -hmm. the exercise of discretion on one issue, whether or not to allow a certain witness in or a certain piece of evidence, could have entirely changed the course of her case. Mm -hmm. A couple pieces of evidence were very strong against Melanie at trial. Mm -hmm. One of the pieces of evidence here was that she purchased a Taurus revolver, uh, a 38 Special they call it, two days before her husband disappeared. So on the surface, this is about the most damning piece of evidence you can hear. Um, when we break it down on our show and when we speak to an independent expert, you may come to understand it in a different light. Possibly. Uh, another piece of evidence was that um, Melanie had driven to Atlantic City, taken a couple of trips to Atlantic City, where she said her husband had fled to. They had a fight. Uh, she says that he struck her, he left, and he went to Atlantic City because that's what his go-to place was, to blow off steam. And she, in you know, her irrational mind, uh, drove there looking for him. The pro she got caught on Easy Pass, her car. She tried to have the Easy Pass charges removed a couple of days later, or not a couple, sorry, a couple of weeks later. That for me is pro the Easy Pass, mm -hmm. the, the charges and the, re the removal are probably the hardest evidence for me to swallow if mm -hmm. I were to believe her story. Mm -hmm. uh, she has explanations, of course, for them. They're problematic for me, and I think it's very damning. There was a grainy video of her you can see mm -hmm. in getting into his car. The prosecutor said that's her placing his car there to set up an alibi. Mm -hmm. She says, no, 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 that's me finding his car and moving it because I was so mad at him and this was mm -hmm. something he had done to me in the past. Very, very difficult uh, on both sides. Mm -hmm. So there's more evidence. For me, those two are mm -hmm. the most striking probably in this case. I will also say that they found his body um, and uh, they claimed that she had shot him mm -hmm. and dismembered him in her apartment, in her townhouse. Uh, that was connected to several other townhouses, and she had two small children in that house. And yet, when they went through the house five times and ripped out the drains and the walls and the floors, they couldn't find one piece of forensic evidence. So I would say, for me, the lack of crime scene and forensic evidence works most strongest in her favor of her innocence. Well, actually, Megan spoke to a surgeon about the way the body was cut. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I think his... I think he was the most riveting, what he had to say. I mean, there was a few people that, because the way this worked is Megan had done most of the interviews, mm -hmm. but I didn't hear them until we were live on air. Mm -hmm. So it was really fun for me because I was that. able to like, you know, she kept this all, but you know, we're close friends and colleagues, office mates, and <laughs> somehow a lot of this stuff, I was like, wait, what did they just say? <laughs> you know, it was so exciting to me because I was just shocked at how many, there were several items that I was shocked about, mm -hmm. but I think... The surgeon's testimony was the most um, riveting. Mm -hmm. So we did some research to find out how high the railing was on the bridge and how much the suitcases weighed. Mm -hmm. The and body, we were parts, in the the body parts in the suitcases. Um, and we were conservative. So we, yeah, uh, they were. So um, what was it, 80 pounds? So we estimated the torso was 80 pounds, and I found a report that actually said it was 94. 94. So we went to um, the gym with a suitcase, put some weights in the suitcase, I, it turned out my height and weight is almost identical to what Melanie was at the time, so it was like a fun experiment. Yeah. And it was shocking to me. 
So they claim she lifted 80 pounds and over a guardrail that was like over 40 a guardrail inches, that was 40 inches, and I was not even to get, I wasn't able to get air on what 40 was. No, it? You, you couldn't get any air on 80, on 60, no. barely anything. 40 was what you were able to lift over, and that. And was there's even... no way that suitcase was 40 pounds. It's actually physiologically impossible, right? Yeah. yeah. So that to me blew a huge hole in the case. For me, I think it's getting justice for Bill, which could mm -hmm. either be you know, putting to rest the fact, okay, Melanie's, Melanie's guilty, and right. let's move on. Right. Or bringing the person to justice who is actually um, responsible, and then getting justice for Melanie and Melanie's family if she is, in fact, innocent. Mm -hmm. I think also the second piece for me would be, um, so when, the pro when I spoke with the prosecutor who would not interview and who asked me if I, didn't I have anything better to do with my time? And, um, you know, we have a system, the appellate system is handling this. I'm sorry, we are the oversight mm -hmm. for the courts. It is not just the appellate system. We are the people, all of us are the oversight here. So for me, putting as much oversight on the courts and, and taking, you know, shining a light on the possible wrongs that happen mm -hmm. or the things that maybe aren't open to the public, that's really mm -hmm. important. And perhaps podcasts like this could serve as a deterrent for other prosecutorial misconduct or police misconduct. Mm -hmm. Maybe people will realize like, Oh, the public's holding a microscope to what we're doing now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to greater, start following the rules. <laughs> I, think, I think it's greater accountability. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Melanie has pretty much, she lost all of her state appeals. So she's now in the federal system. Mm -hmm. And what she feels very strongly is that she's never going to get a fair shake in the courts. Her chances, people, the, the chances in the federal system, the chances of an appeal are minuscule. Mm -hmm. So I think she feels at this point the only way to make some traction, um, maybe for her own peace of mind, maybe for her, she had children, for mm -hmm. them to hear the truth is for her to tell it. Mm -hmm. And and perhaps I think she also realizes that this might be a chance for some anonymous, all it takes is one tip, right? Mm -hmm. We're opening up, we're, we're opening the podcast up to help. If someone calls in one piece of evidence that wasn't there, she could have a shot. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just hope.